episode 72. People can get really cute about how they think or what they think makes a great restaurant or what the recipe for a great restaurant is. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how advanced restaurants become. They're still built on fundamental principles and they're still built by great people. Hey, everybody, this is the Just Forking Around podcast, where every week we raise our glass and toast to the beautifully insane, sexy world of food adventures. Expect a variety pack of guests every week, all have the most compelling stories. They are the brewers, the distillers, the authors, winemakers, farmers, vegan product makers restaurateurs, top chefs, entrepreneurs. I mean, truly inspirational, motivational. This is ear ball riveting. So settle in and let's fork around. Forking around reminds me of my social media platforms that I would love to share with you. (laughs) At Forking Podcast, that is Instagram. So at Forking Podcast, website, justforkingaround.net. And Facebook is my personal page, Debbie.Salzberg. And if you're on the iTunes, enjoying the podcast, I would love, if you enjoyed the show, to subscribe, rate, and review. Much love. And now let's really get into this next episode. Welcome, everybody, to another episode. And this one is awesome. Piatta Italian Street Food restaurant concept. is a fast casual restaurant, has 42 locations in seven states, and they serve piadas, pastas, and salads. Uh, I love this restaurant concept. Um, Matt Eisenacher, he is the chief concept officer, and he oversees the branding, the marketing, IT, business development, and he's phenomenal. I mean, this guy is, we have such a great conversation. I'm super excited for you guys to dig in on this one. Uh, He joined, just let's qualify Matt Eisenacher for a minute. So he joined Piata back in 2013. And at that time, they only had 16 units, uh, 16 outlets, restaurants. And since then, he has helped grow the brand to 42 units. Yeah, 42 restaurants across seven states. And what I love about Piata, I mean, if you don't know what a Piata is... Basically, it's inspired by the Italian food carts from the town of Rimini in Italy. So the a piatta, well, you know what? I'm going to have you, you have to listen to the episode to learn what a piatta is if you don't know already. (laughs) But the concept is really cool. And the more that I dug in and learned about this restaurant group, the more I fell in love with Matt Eisenacher and the founder. Uh, His name is Chris, Chris Duty. Yes, that's his last name. (laughs) And they have tons of accolades. I mean, I know that in 2018, their restaurant group won the, recently was awarded the 2018 Smart 50 Awards. They also were named number 13 on restaurant businesses' future 50 list. And I love how they've created a partner incentive profit sharing program. So basically it allows the individual partners to share in the restaurant's success, which I really find to be awesome. <laughs> I do. I really, I love that. So their, their headquarters are in Columbus, Ohio, but their locations are Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Texas. Um, they're going to be opening up in Minneapolis. So they are definitely reaching around the United States. So before we get into this episode with Matt Eisenacher, again, a special welcome to the new listeners. I am so happy you're here. And for the returning ones, welcome back. You know, I like to preamble. So I have to tell you a couple things that are going on. So as you're listening to this episode on Tuesday, I am on an airplane on my way to podcast movement. Yeah, podcast movement, huge. Once a year, um, we all get together, a bunch of podcasters. And we go have a four-day event, and it's awesome. This year, it's in Philadelphia. So I'm on my way to Philadelphia from Santa Monica. And um, yeah, we kind of all get together. We do a lot of uh, 
seminars. We do a lot of schmoozing with each other uh, because you know how podcasts are audio. So we have all these uh, people that we are in contact with through Facebook groups and other groups. And now we get to all come together and party and hang out and share stories. So I'm psyched about that. So stay tuned to see what comes out of Podcast Movement 2018. (laughs) So there's a couple of things I want to mention, which is actually kind of a funny story. I was watching, I'm going to admit, I was watching like some cheesy, I wouldn't say cheesy, but it's celebrity news, you know, like Extra or Access Hollywood, something like that. It was just flashed on the TV and they were showing Tom Brady and Giselle, and you know, I'm a Patriots fan, huge, because I'm from Boston, in Costa Rica. And so, you know, I was in Costa Rica and I did the six-part series Uh, forking around Costa Rica. And one of the episodes, which is episode 066 with Chef James Kelly. Well, he is the personal chef to Tom and Giselle. And in that episode, episode 66, if you haven't listened to it, highly recommend. Chef James is awesome. But we weren't, there's a confidentiality agreement. So he can't really talk about Tom and Giselle but I can, I can talk about it. So that's what I'm going to do now. I don't know if I really mentioned it in the past, but Chef James is the personal chef. And so whenever uh, Tom and Giselle come to Costa Rica, because they do uh, have a home there, he uh, cooks for them and hangs out with them. And so there was a, a little span of Costa Rica and Santa Teresa, and that's where I was. And they were showing uh, the family on the beach. And I was thinking to myself, ah, Chef James is cooking for them for sure. (laughs) So I just wanted to mention that. I thought that was pretty cool. And then there's just one other thing that keeps coming up for me. And it has to do with taxes and happy hour here in Los Angeles. Okay. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. So I'll go to like a happy hour sometimes in the afternoon, you know, from four to six, grab a beer because $5, right? $5 beer. Perfect. So there's this one restaurant that I was at the other day and it's in Marina Del Rey. And it's actually, I'll name it, Salt Restaurant. I'm just going to name it because it's easier. So Salt Restaurant. So happy hour beer is $5. But when you go to pay, it's $6. So, it, and it's only a dollar, I know. But for me, it's the, I don't understand because every place I go, a $5 beer is a different price. And I know there's taxes and you can say it's the counties, but it's all LA County. So at the marina there, it's a $5 beer, $6. Right around the corner, the $5 beer is $5.77. And then on the other side around the corner, the $5 beer is $5. So I've been asking the people at the restaurants, because I'm from the restaurant industry, so I know it's how you program it and how you build the tax into the price. However, as a guest, I'm like, it just gets confusing when you go to like three different restaurants or bars all within the neighborhood and a $5 beer is $5.77 or $6 or $5. So if anybody has any intel on that or any insights, just can you send me an email, uh, dsalty00 at gmail.com or give me a call. You can always just call me. So on my social media platform at Forking Podcast. <laughs> you can just hit the call button and my number's there. So I really want some feedback on this. And if you anybody else scratches her head at this phenomena of a five dollar beer being five seventy seven, six dollars, and five dollars all within one neighborhood. <laughs> I know these are important things in life, but it's a it's a wonder to me. And it's not the seventy seven cents or the dollar. It's the I don't understand principle kind of thing. And as a guest, if I'm not from the restaurant industry, I would be, I would probably be extremely curious. <laughs> so definitely reach out to me. So that's, that's what I have for my preamble today. And without any further ado, please enjoy this episode with Matt Eisenacher. All right. So Matt, Welcome, yes. welcome, welcome. I'm so excited. Let's see that the official title is Chief Concept Officer at PI. And head dishwasher, head dishwasher some days too. Someday, oh, I'm sure, right? And, <laughs> and you're coming to us live 
from the uh, piada in a kitchen, I believe. Are you are you sitting eating a delicious pasta? Bowl? Yeah, I, I just finished a carbonara pasta from uh, from our kitchen. We have a test kitchen, and it's a little little office. There's only about twenty of us in this in this office, but we have a little kitchen behind us. And chef brought me a little present today, so I love just a, it. a surprise all the way around. Yeah, all right. Well, let's do this. Let's start off with a toast, as we always do. And so, I it's it is only nine. It's actually nine o three a.m. on the West Coast here. So. Usually when I'm on the boat, I um, partake in rosé. Uh, but this morning, I just have a Starbucks coffee. So it's just a regular pike. So I'm going to raise my my mug to you and tell us what you are going to be toasting with and to. Yeah. You know, I wish I was... My drink of choice is typically a Jameson uh, on the rocks. Actually, we'll say Jameson neat. But this morning or afternoon, I'll use a uh, Starbucks cold brew. Uh, to to do our toast. <laughs> All right, so I raise my bu- my bucks and you raise your bucks. And what's the toast? We're gonna toast to breakfast for lunch. It's uh, something we've been playing around with here. Just uh, had a little bit some of our had some of the items earlier today, so it's been top of mind for us. We're gonna we're gonna cheers to breakfast for lunch. Who doesn't love a good breakfast? I love it. Cheers. Here, here. I'm gonna take a sip of my cheers. coffee. Mm. Okay, so Matt, what? Let's talk about what Piata. Street. What is their concept? What exactly is Piata Italian street food? And then we'll dive in a little bit deeper into what taking over the taking over the uh, world domination here with that uh, Piata Italian street of food. <laughs> of course, yeah. So you know, Piata is a fast casual Italian eatery, and so you know, fast casual to some people isn't really a, a term they use unless you're in the industry. But essentially, uh, we are an Italian inspired concept that you can move down the line. And you see your items made as you move down the line. So our core, our core items are uh, pastas. We have angel hair pasta. We have uh, salads. We'll do create your own salads. Then we have a menu of salads. And then our uh, one of our signature items is uh, is the piatta itself. And the piatta is a, it's a really thin crust dough, and um, you you see it baked on the stone in front of you. So you get a little bit of the magic of the seasoning and the olive oil, and it, it activates the dough. And so you see these great bubbles on the dough. And it, it just gives a little theater to the experience, something very new and different to to a fast casual setting. So, so yeah, that's that's Piata, and we've we've grown uh, 42 strong, and we're anywhere from Pet- Pittsburgh all the way up to Minneapolis and down into Houston and Dallas right now. Wow, that's amazing! Congratulations on that. I mean, I've been watching the trajectory, um, and then you and you came on board. Gosh, what 2013, I believe. I did. And I did. Yeah. yeah. So we, yep. We, we, I came on in 2013. So in that year we went from, uh, eight to 16, which, you know, you do the math and you figure <laughs> how, you know, it, just, yeah. it was just a crazy That's year. Crazy. And that is crazy. 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 Yeah. And, and the good news is we had, we had added eight locations where at that time you could drive to them. So it was, it was very doable. And, um, so there were the markets surrounding Columbus, Ohio, where we're from, and so that allowed us to, to learn um, learn the business a little bit, get our feet under us. That was our first big wave of growth, and I joined during that wave because at that time my responsibility was marketing, and you know we had a lot of education to do. We a lot of people didn't know, you know, what Piata was, and, and that was my job to introduce them to the brand and the food. So, so basically, when you started, you were director of marketing, right? That's correct. And That's correct. Yeah. So take us through. So your director of marketing, just to give us an idea of how, like, the different you know positions in an org chart. So your director of marketing, and then you you uh, are VP of marketing and brand development, and then now you're the chief concept officer. So what what is the is that similar? It's just in a, a scale, larger scale, or how does um, that work? No, for it, your, it's so yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people that you know are listening that are part of small small companies and startups. And, you know, one of the things I always say is, you know, be careful when you raise your hand sometimes, you know, you wear, you wear, you wear a lot of hats, you know, at a small organization, there's just a few of you and you all wear a variety of hats. And so just early on, you know, completely outside of marketing, I just kind of jumped into things and wanted to, wanted to learn and, and, and push them forward. And the first one was technology. And I, I had a passion for how technology could, you know, really make the guest experience better um, and so, you know, kind of took, took that on early and, and bolted that on. And then, uh, you know, we wanted to build a catering organization, you know, more and more food nowadays is going outside of, four, you know, the four walls of the restaurant. Yeah, it's huge. And so it's, it's huge, huge growth. Uh, Regar- regardless growth if you want to or not, it's almost like, you it seems to. like you have to. Yeah. 
Yeah, you got to. I mean, when we opened up our first restaurant, 60% of our dine-ins or 60% of our sales were dine-in, right? So people sat in our dining rooms. A lot of our locations now, you know, we have a lot of locations. It could be as low as 30, 40%. Wow. And that's driven by, you know, people were taking food off site. They're, they're demanding to consume food in different ways. And so, so yeah, you, it's just, it's not a want to, it's, you know, you have to. And uh, so we built a nationwide uh, catering network. And um, so I jumped into that. And then recently, you know, uh, operations uh, came into that as well, because, you know, my role is really about, you know, championing the guest experience from A to Z. And all of those things touch the guest experience. It's really important that you have a really well thought out, consistent guest journey. I have a question about this, this concept of, you know, j- the journey of the guest experience. And then kind of pinging that back over to takeout and delivery. When you're saying you're building a catering network, is that outsourcing delivery service or or are you creating your own type of delivery service so you're more hands-on with the experience from ordering to finality? Yeah, you got it. I mean, for us, we're very hands-on culture. We, we We don't feel good about, especially for a catering experience, allowing anyone to touch that because people aren't buying food, they're buying an experience and they're they're buying, they're buying the person. And so we, we have a, a system of local uh, managers, local coordinators and delivery drivers, but they're, they're, they're employed by us. And it was a, I mean, it was a big undertaking, you know, we're only. That's huge. Cause there's, I'm in LA, you know, and there's so many, there's uh, all these delivery services. Like I'll get, I, mean, I don't want to say maybe the names of them, but I gonna tell you my experience was so bad that I knew it wasn't reflective of the restaurant you know, just because I know that. However, my mental, you know, my my idea is like, okay, that sucked, you know? <laughs> and so so that's huge. Like, so I have chills when you said that. That's like a really big, huge undertaking. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I will say, I will say, because was what you're speaking of um, are probably, well, okay, so I won't say the names of the companies either, but we have tested those for single, for single deliveries. We do, we do play around with that a little bit. That the where we distinguish the line is if you're engaging us for a large group or a catering occasion where there are, you know, there's 100, 150 people, we, we will not trust that yeah. experience to an outside individual. We want to set it up. We want to we want to make sure that if there's something that doesn't meet your expectations, we have a representative for Piata on site. So we do distinguish that. But I. I share your headache. We, you know, the, the, the delivery thing is, it's like the wild, wild west right now. Right. And, and one thing about the deliveries, there's, there's a newer, it's funny. I was going to ask you about the, this was one of my questions later on for you was, was what your thought about was, uh, you know, the future of food and tech and how that, how that kind of works together. There's other concepts as well. Uh, what's the, the, the guy from Uber who's creating those cloud, are they cloud nine outlets? Do you know about those that, I, I've not heard of that yet. Okay, well, we can talk about that after, but it's just um, it's just something that's really interesting, which has... So basically, like your test kitchen could turn into a kitchen that only services delivery. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I've asked, uh, I've asked Uber, I mean, it, 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 you imagine, and it's going to happen, it's a matter of when, where they're going to start vertically integrating to open up their own restaurants, right? I mean, they have these relationships directly with the guests. You're going to see more of that. And, you know, I've even asked, I've said, you know, are you open to finding other current restaurant partners that can help you foray into these other types of concepts? I mean, we also have, you know, we have kitchens, we have chefs, we have things that we can do to help that. But it's, uh, it's, it's a little crazy right now. And, and I think when you talk to these delivery companies, they, they're figuring it out as well. I mean, they're growing so fast. I don't think they've gotten them, their yeah. feet under them as well either. Agreed. I went to, I was, I was at a, a event last night. It was a panel and there was a bunch of different rep- people from different um, aspects of the restaurant industry, from delivery. And it was just, and so it is the Wild West. I was like, one of the questions asked the panel, you know, what's the future, you know, in two or three years? And I'm thinking, no one knows. <laughs> I mean, the pizza delivery, uh, the, the automated one. So let's get into a little bit more about, about Piata. So Piata, the actual Piata itself, um, that product, it stems from uh, Rimini. Is it uh, Emilia Romana? Uh, you got it. Hey, look at that. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. It's, so we, we, always, we always explain to people that really our food is patterned after Northern Italy, which is extremely different than what you would find in Southern Italy, right? So 
you know, we do have a red sauce, but you, you really won't find when you come into Piata, you know, what you would see in your mind with like, you know, the red and white check tablecloth right. and <laughs> the, the guy in the corner are playing the uh, accordion and things like that. So, <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's a modern, um, it's modern Italian uh, pattern after Northern Italy. It was Rimini where, um, at the time, Chris Duty, who's our CEO, he, uh, you know, there's, there were just these food, food carts that he was talking about. There's just these, these families that had these little food carts on the side of the road and you stop at them and there's not much to them. Right. I mean, it's just a family and there's, they're just at this little kiosk and, and he's, he described having some of the best food he's ever had. And if it, it was, it was only a couple ingredients, you know, and, and their uh, Piadina, which is what inspired the Piata, a Piadina is, it's really peasant food. It's a, it's a, it's a dough, it's a thin, thin dough, and you might have uh, some prosciutto, uh, uh, some fresh mozzarella and some fresh basil. And, and that really could be it. You know, it's very simple food, but it's bright, it's fresh. And, and that's really what inspired the Piata. We did infuse a little bit of America into it, but that is that is what uh, gave birth to the uh, the Piata as we know it. That's so amazing. So when we walk, I you know I was looking at some of the pictures of the the physical layout and the beauty. The restaurants are are gorgeous, like the streamlined and the architecture and the the windows and the some have brick. The lighting doesn't look as fast casually as other restaurants may appear in one's mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, you know, that makes me, if you could see my face, you know, I have a big smile on my face because that's that's the idea, right? And that 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 idea that you just articulated is what kind of drives us across all the elements of our brand. We don't, you know, I'll, I'll describe to you and to people that know what fast casual is, 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 you know, we're a fast casual establishment, but we don't, we don't operate that way. We don't try to follow the rules of what you would expect. Our, our, our vision, what drives us is to kind of demolish the expectation of what you would expect to get in a casual setting that's fast. And so the design is one of those, you know, it does not feel like a fast casual establishment, you know, across the food, we, in the line, when you're standing there in line, we will, we will grill fresh salmon to order. And I I will tell you that is not easy. It would be easy easy not to do that. No, I mean, it's not, it's not easy. And so, but those things that drive that, that uniqueness, those things that drive that it's not a fast, casual place like everyone else, those things matter. And the design, the design is a very, very big part of that. Awesome. I mean, I just, yeah, it's very cool. So I, I know that there's a uh, build your own, but I, I feel, did I read that you're, you're adding or moving a little bit away from the original concept of build your own, or is that still incorporated? Um, you know, that's, it, 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 that is one of those really kind of ongoing things that, um, so when we opened our doors, we were 100% a great rent establishment, right? So we, you know, you'd walk down the line, we, we'd kind of invite you in and say, hey, you know, here's this, this whole line of fresh ingredients and to use, you know, another fast casual could, could have one third the amount of ingredients that we, we would have, right? So there's a lot to choose from. And yeah, your wine is full. That is not, it's not a, it's very plentiful and bountiful and beautiful. And yeah, yeah. I mean, you could have up to six, we have three hot sauces, you could have three cold sauces. You might have anywhere from, you know, six, eight, 10 dressings at any one time. And then, you know, just a whole myriad of different fresh toppings and veggies and cheeses. And so what you found is that Italian food's a little more complex. The flavors are more complex. It's not, it's not like Mexican or Asian that can, you know, really a lot of those flavors, they're bold, they can go together very easily. There are things on our line that don't go well together, right? right. And so what we found is that, you know, people people would come in and here they are like, oh yeah, give me, give me those three hot sauces and I'll throw all four cheeses on it and put, you know, cold cucumbers on my pasta. And they're like, this isn't good. <laughs> like, right. we yeah. Know, yeah, right. It, that, that does not look good. So over the years, we have definitely, we have incorporated a, on menu items. And when you walk into our restaurant, you will see 12 menu items in front of you that we, we want you to start with. Um, frankly, if you're a new guest, that's where we want you to start. And so in our new restaurants now, the cool thing is, uh, you you see sales anywhere from eighty to ninety percent are in menu items, and then once people get comfortable, they then you see that crate your own uh, start to build, which is fine. I mean, we, once you get the hang of it, you find your thing. Absolutely cool with that. But the menu items are important 
uh, because you know we want we want our chefs to guide you into the best items, and and we know that that sometimes takes a chef to help you do that. Right. Uh, and so that's yeah, it's a much bigger part of our menu now. You mentioned a little bit about culture, and what is what's your definition of culture, and how does that translate across the board for you? Is it with the staff? Is it with the is it with the vibe? Like, what is culture? You know, I'm sure, you know, there's so many different different ways to describe it, but it's you know, for a, for a small company, it's it's what happens when you're not there, right? So when you when you start off and you're a small company, the the inclination is to kind of drive your company from a central point, uh, I think, and you know, as you grow, you end up, you know, you end up stepping away from parts of your business and starts to grow away from the center. So we, you know, we're very big on decentralizing and having our markets and our teams kind of drive everything locally. And as part of that, when, when you're not there, what happens? How, how do people speak to each other? How do people treat each other? What do they hold themselves to? Where do they focus? I mean, all of those things and all of those questions and all of the details that go into one shift at a restaurant you know, when things go wrong, and they always do, what does the team fall back to? And what are their tendencies? And, you know, for instance, I'll use the example of the food. You know, it, it said we, we always preach it's either right or it's wrong. And you have to you have to practice that when you visit the restaurants and you taste the food and you model that behavior. Because when you're not there, right, if you're multi-unit or no one from the home office is coming into your restaurant for a day or a week, is your team, are they focused enough? Do they value that enough? Do they live that each day so that they know when they walk in, they're going to taste everything on the line before the guest does? And so it's those things, those practices, those beliefs, and how embedded they are in the person that's furthest away from, you know, furthest away or the, the, the restaurant that might be furthest away. I mean, that's how I'd say you measure and understand how culture permeates and drives drives a practice. That was an excellent, I mean, that was really, that was probably the most well, well um, described and that was really good. All right, uh, I, yeah. okay, good, <laughs> so I, like, good. I was like, wow, that's brilliant. I really think about that. And so what does your job entail? I mean, do you, obviously you're in a test kitchen right now, as you noted earlier, uh, but what do you, what's your, what's a day in a life of like Matt? I mean, <laughs> that's probably a really crazy question, but what does your position hold, the chief concept officer? You know, I, um, and, and this is, this has been a hard thing, but um, I, I intentionally try not to structure my day too much myself. And what I mean by that is, I think if you're going to, if you're going to build a culture and you're going to build a culture of decentralization, you know, for someone like me, you have to be willing to kind of yield your time a little bit to those around you. And, you know, I, I, whether it's, whether it's you know, making a decision or jumping into a fire to help where someone needs it, or are there just times where it, especially as you're growing, there's, there's growing pains, there's things you're learning, you know, someone like me, it, my, my day is so fluid that um, I intentionally try not to book um, time myself. And, you know, obviously there's, there's some things you have to get done, but you just have to be able to yield yourself to the teams around you. And you have to kind of understand where you're needed and kind of go with the flow. So it's probably not the answer you... No, that you makes sense. This much. No, that totally makes sense. So what, what like, right this moment where... Because you're not in Columbus, correct? You uh, no, I am. I actually am in Columbus. Are you, is yeah. this, are you at the um, original test office there where Chris was? Um, yeah. You, yeah. So that's the original. I, I was. He was saying something about before you all launched, you had a bunch of like 750, you know, tastes people coming through for nine to ten months before you launched the first, and I think it was in September of 2010. Uh, so you're in the original. Is it the OG, the original? It's the OG. <laughs> it's the OG. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was just talking to some people about it. It's. It's kind of, and I can do air quotes while I'm doing this. It's okay. kind of an office. <laughs> it's kind of a test kitchen, and it's kind of uh, an amalgamation of just our growth. Uh, it's. It's. We've definitely got in, gotten a little congested, and uh, you know, we literally have desks surrounding our, our test kitchen, and so 
Um, initially, what it was, it, it was a, an old warehouse, and we had a couple offices. And then the whole middle area was really where the furniture and equipment from our first restaurant was. And Chris, uh, he really just made a mock piata, and uh, the first piata, and just brought people in off the street. They tasted the food, and he just kept iterating that month after month. And eventually, we moved all that equipment to our first restaurant, and it just kind of evolved into our into our corporate office. So see, when I think about the, so the test kitchen, so now that was old school. You know, when I say old school, I mean eight years ago. Now we have you know analytics, and we have all these other ways of of tracking you know the market demands and what people think. So thinking back then, 2010. I mean, obviously you're you're still keeping that the uh, test kitchen for in-house. But do you, how do you translate now the tracking now that you've gotten to what, 42 units or stores? Do you track in a different way? Does that make um, sense? Track so like it, test markets. Track. Yeah, what people's flavor profiles are, what ad things are, how well something's doing or, you know, it, I picture no restaurant pre-restaurant tasting in a kitchen, you know, 750 people in and out, just random and friends to testing in markets that now you have 42 restaurants. How- yeah, great question. Great question. So we, if you follow us on Instagram, I guess that's a nice, nice little plug there. But if you look at Instagram, we, we kind of put into practice last year for the first time, um, something we call the taste tour. And the idea was that uh, it was really built around the idea of this really kind of radical menu change we did last year. And we went to uh, many of our markets and we literally here all went on the road and we took the items to people. We brought in um, influencers, we brought, brought, brought in guests, we brought in media, and we just got feedback. And um, we did it again to actually launch the food. But you know, now recently we did this again this spring. And we go to these markets and, you know, we are sitting down with people. We are holding events. Um, we are bringing out the food for them to taste. And so I guess in a sense, you know, it's, it's what we originally did, but we've taken it on the road a little bit. And it kind of reinforces, one, it reinforces the food culture because when you can get your chef team on the road and the local team gets to kind of be a part of it, it puts an emphasis and spotlight on the food. And two is just rejuvenating. I mean, the teams being able to come in and see all these people going crazy for the food, and you know, they're off in corners taking self or yeah. selfies, but taking yes. pictures of it. And, so, um, so paint the picture. So you, I, I physically, I was, I think to to grasp the idea, you literally take the tasting kit on the road via mm -hmm. Instagram. So that's so so brilliant. So then people are taking the pictures and they're putting on Instagram and you're also getting that community kind of social effect that's not so much internet driven and you know it's actual. It's, you can actually touch yeah. taste. Yeah, yeah, and it helps us build it helps us build. I mean, look, it's really hard to create relationships when you're scaling as many markets at one time. So, you know, here we had so many friends of the friends and friends of the brand and just people that helped us spread the good word, but when you go to uh, Minneapolis, right? We we hadn't built as many of those relationships, so it's it's kind of this this great internal thing that really builds the culture and the food culture, and it brings the the, the ability to build new relationships, build the community, uh, build the just build your uh, kind of coalition of evangelists for the brand, and so it kind of it kind of checks a lot of boxes for us. I love that. I. I... That's that's brilliant, actually. When you when you really think about it, right? And it it's still congruent with how you how it all started, <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And yeah. then there's another aspect of I think of your brand that you, in order to kind of create support the culture and your and your teams, um, has is it with the profit sharing or how? I think something. If you want to talk about that a little bit about how you incorporate that into ownership for your your staff, in a sense. Yeah, so we we think it's important that when you have a, a chef that runs your location, that you have to give them ownership in the, in the location, and they're they're essentially their their performance needs to drive uh, what what you know how they're how they're compensated. And so we uh, developed a profit sharing plan that allows our local chefs and partners, um, our piata partners, what we call um, the chef who runs each location, and based on their performance for the year, um, really the sky's the limit. Um, it's it's not capped, so they have the ability to really, uh, if they have the passion for their business, and they really want to make it theirs, 
and they really want to rejuvenate or uh, really drive their team and build their culture, um, then they obviously celebrate in that success. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's that also helps maintain the uh, integrity of the brand because they part ownerships. So I think that a lot of times restaurants, it's something that is it's harder to implement afterwards. Is that like there? There's a lot of it seems like this concept with Piata. There was a lot of uh, pre thought, like pre game, like okay, if we expand or if we grow this, maybe not knowing it was going to be so big, but that it's expandable. You kind of have to have the components at least. Uh, scalable beforehand and in, in these these important pieces, or is it something that you had to add as the c o o you know it's it's it was it's really both to be to be candid um, CCO, sorry. Of, yeah so chris the, the great thing about chris is he he did that i don 't know how much you know about Chris, but he did this with Rio Bravo restaurant group, and he you know was part of growing that brand, just he and his brother um, initially and and grew it into a nationwide brand. And so, you know, there is a lot about the scale that, you know, is is known by our management team. And you do have the ability to kind of pre-contemplate you know, how things should be and what you need to have in place. You know, the, it'd be silly if, if I said that we had, we had it all figured out. And some of it you do learn along the way. And so, you know, the profit sharing plan was something that we did put in uh, a couple years into it. Um, you know, the other thing we did, which is kind of the reverse of local, but but is important for the culture, is we also put into place, uh, I want to say two years ago now, uh, what we call Piata University. And you know now our plan is to do this three times a year where we fly every partner in. So we have 42 partners. We not only fly them in three times a year, but now we've expanded it to uh, high potential young leaders. And, and I don't mean young as in you know, age young, but just people that might be newer to your company that show a lot of potential. And so we, we spend the money to bring them in three times a year and we just finished last week and the enthusiasm the vibe the connection you get and you know you your partner in minneapolis meets their counterpart in pittsburgh pennsylvania and that cross-pollinization and the energy and kind of comes from that is is immeasurable and and so those things are things that you know some of it you do learn over time and and uh, but they're they're incredibly valuable. Even even though they're tar- hard to pull off, especially when you have a footprint this large. Right, three three important. times a year. But three times a year, I could see how that would be totally that uh, uh, that seems grand. But it also is important because once a year is not enough, right? I mean, in a sense, you kind of forget. Yeah, but three times that makes sense. But we started at one time a year, and we just you kind of just felt the magic kind of fall off a little bit. If you want to keep that alive, you want to you want to keep them kind of connected to one another. Yeah, I love that. So before, I, I have a couple other questions, but Matt, what's your, let's talk a little bit about you. I mean, where, where are you from? Let's talk about where you're from and what you're, a little bit about your trajectory. Just a, yeah, a little Yeah, funny, I'm not, I have no background and I'm very open to people uh, about this, but I had no background in restaurants before I came here. And uh, the funny, but the really genuine story about it is, um, I, there was one that opened by my house, a Piata opened by my house, and uh, the line was wrapped around the building, literally. And my wife kept saying, we got to go in this place. And I said, well, this fast casual thing's gotten out of control. They're putting spaghetti, <laughs> spaghetti in a burrito. I am not taking part in that, right? So I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go to the restaurant. So I guess I should take a page out of that from a marketing perspective. But, um, but anyway, so, so seven, eight, I don't know, a ton of people uh, were like, you have to go to this place. So my wife drug me in. And, you know, at the time, my background was in, was in marketing. And I just, I immediately, she'll tell you to this day, like, I was just so enamored where with the lights and the, and the chef coats and the way the food was presented and the music and the wood and the decor. I just got it instantly. I just completely got it. And I, at that time, didn't, didn't know anyone, didn't really know much about Piata. So I, I found this random guy on LinkedIn who happens to be our CFO. And I said, hey, you know, I... Uh, I, I don't, I'm not looking for a job or anything, but I just think what you guys are doing is amazing. And, you know, I just noticed a few things from a branding perspective and, you know, I, I shared, I don't remember what they were now, but I shared some things with him and Chris called me back the next day <laughs> nice. and, and that's how I ended up here. So, you know, you, the, the opportunities come when you least expect it. And, uh, and it, but it was a very genuine connection to what brought me to Piata. That's a great story, Matt. I love that. Was that picture of the scooter always there? Is that in that restaurant there's a big mural 
I love that yeah. picture. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a black. It, it's funny. I assume you're talking about the black and white picture, right? Yes, yes. So if I were to show you that original picture, it's actually not black and white. If you zoom out, because we cropped it, 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 it wish people more people knew this, but it's actually a, a, a man and a woman on a, on a scooter on a cobblestone street, and there's a baby in between them. And oh when you see it, it's like the exact idea for why the scooter is is our brain mark. It's fun. It's fast. It's approachable. And here are these people driving down the street. They just have a baby in between them. It's just they're just on the go, man. They have no <laughs> no concerns, no helmets, no. I mean, just, they're just doing it. I love it. <clears throat> that's cool. Yeah, that was a very uh, that's a very cool mural. So, yeah, that's that that caught my attention. So I know that there, we we started uh, mentioning about a when we did the toast uh, breakfast for lunch, and I know that this is something that you're testing or about to launch. So let's talk about breakfast for lunch. Yeah, so it's just fun. Like, I don't know how to explain it to people, and they think there's some, you know, like very deep reason for why we would do it. But you know, we you know we try and get out. We go on culinary tours. We go on visits, and sometimes you're just out experiencing and. You know, there's just this kind of emergence of the breakfast occasion and it's comforting, you know, everyone who doesn't love eggs and it's just a, it's just a fun, lighthearted occasion. And, you know, from a brand experience, it's definitely something we're trying to infuse. Maybe you see our decor, for instance, I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhat serious. I mean, it's very clean, clean lines. And so, you know, there is a concerted effort uh, for, for us to bring a little bit more fun, a little bit more energy into it. And there's just something about the breakfast occasion that just does that. You know, we've got a, a, a fun little uh, line that introduces it to people, and we're trying to have fun with it. And that's kind of the whole idea behind it. Um, it it's just a different type of occasion. And uh, so we'll see. You know, we're we're testing it at two of our um, two of our locations in Columbus, Ohio. We had the first weekend. Uh, the items were about twenty percent of sales. Uh, which is a good. Oh, that's good. good. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah, it's really, it's really good. So we had good, good reception to it, and uh, we're having the second right now. We're just doing it on the weekends until we kind of see what guests tell us, and uh, and we're just kind of rolling with it. Nice, I love it. So I feel like we've we've hit a lot of key points. Did I did I miss anything that you really feel though we we need to uh, to touch on? You know, I. I... One of the things I, um, I, I was looking a little bit at, you know, some of your other interviews and you talk a lot about menu and food and, you know, the interesting thing for us, and, and I share this only because I'm sure there's people out there that are learning um, from companies that are growing. And, you know, one of the things that's been the most fluid for us is our menu. And, you know, for us, when you walk into an establishment where all of the food is being made in front of you. Um, one of the challenges we've had is the sheer breadth of our menu, the, the number of sauces, the number of ingredients. Um, we've really tested and refined and, and learned uh, over the, uh, these few years of how you introduce your menu to people. You know, when, in the fast casual world, when you walk in, you're usually used to pointing and, and, and really not using a menu. In, the, in Piata, uh, we you really kind of need the menu. There's a lot of things you may not understand. You may not know what pancetta is. You know, we don't call it red sauce. It's a pomodoro. Um, there are there are some words that are new to people, and we think that's important for differentiation. So the menu has been something that has probably been the, uh, the thing that has been most fluid in our growth. And where our focus is right now, where a large part of my focus is, is leveraging technology to make that a much more uh, user uh, or guest-centric experience experience. And if you go to, for instance, our website, you can kind of see the origins of that, where everything, every ingredient is, is, is visual. So you understand what you're getting and you can kind of understand all the choices that are available to you. And so really where I'm focusing right now is trying to leverage that, that online experience to bring that into the restaurant to make the fast casual uh, process, the ordering process much smoother and much more efficient for the guest. So would that be like looking up at a menu or is it handhelds or when you say... We've tried both. Yeah, we've tried both. So initially, when we, had, we were creating your own, there's you know five menu boards and it's like, hey, here's your proteins, here's your sauces and toppings, good luck. Right, right, uh, yeah, right. then, then, you know, you take that. So you can still create your own. You're yeah. welcome to do that. But then we have 12 menu items and we have seven grill items or proteins you can put on that. And then we have side items. So you can imagine when you see that breadth, 
the, the thing that really has given us the biggest pause is that you, you almost can't fit that on a menu board, right? right. You just, there's just too much. And so we have gone to a point where our menu boards are more of just a large feature, right? There's one featured item and then there's a menu card. And we've over the years really tested with our guests. And now we kind of have a hybrid of both where we have uh, our best featured items up on the board. Um, and then we reference you to a menu card uh, for all of the information, calories, um, everything. And so, you know, but it's, it's just not optimal. You want people to have one place to look. And so right. technology is, is, you know, behind people, technology is one of our, one of our highest priorities. Cause I pictured the, to expedite the, the fast part of the casual <laughs> the, to, is um, the fluidity of, of ordering in a sense. Yeah. Cause there's a lot to communicate, right? I mean, you're standing at the stone you, you, you have, you know, I don't know how many ingredients we have, maybe 25. It's a lot to communicate to that person. And in my perfect world, if I could design what I think would be the best way to do that, wouldn't it be cool? Everyone's got a kiosk in their pocket, right? You, you, you talk about kiosks in the restaurant, but everyone's got one in their pocket. So if you could, when you're standing in line, when you're in the queue for a piada, if you could configure your order on your phone and it just generates a little QR code. So when you go up to the stone, you kind of, hey, hey, how are you? Um, what can I get for you? You scan your barcode, it shows up behind the line and they just start making it. And you don't need to kind of go through this whole dissertation for what you want your bowl. Wow, that's, that would that be doesn't brilliant. doesn't exist, by the way. This is kind of my head <laughs> no, right but now. That, so I but that's just what you do in your free time <laughs> when you think about things. <laughs> no, but that makes sense, right? So that when you get to the... And you're so you're still um, incorporating, you know, ordering via human to human. However, you've, you've kind of... Uh, kind of uh, streamlined the hawing and humming maybe at the at the menu that's board. The, yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. Gosh, I could talk to you all day. You're 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 awesome. I I, I appreciate your time oh, and awesome. I know it's been it's almost fun. an hour. It's awesome. So I you know I don't know if um do you have any recipes off the top of your head that you want to share with us? A recipe, something that could be something simple or food or beverage maybe I know you drink Jameson neat so that doesn't really count. <laughs> oh man. I, I I have to I have to think about that. I mean I, I would always say hey, I'm gonna go figurative on you. I'm I'm gonna take okay, you out of it. the literal world. Do I'm it. gonna say, you know, in a place in, in a high growth environment, if you wanna build a, an organization that is going to stand the test of time, that's your recipe, uh, first, second, third ingredient is people, people, people. And it's I know that's gonna be a boring answer, but you I think so, so often now in the age of technology, um, people can get really cute about how they think or what they think makes a great restaurant or what the recipe for a great restaurant is. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how advanced restaurants become. They're still built on fundamental principles and they're still built by great people. And so, you know, it's a simple lesson that if you're, if you're starting a company and you, and you have aspirations of growing it, um, don't lose sight of that recipe because those things don't change over time. Uh, well said, Matt. See, you're awesome. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to explore some piadas when I'm out in that area. I have a Go feeling... Give me a call when you're in one of our markets. I definitely will. I'm going to... I probably will be in the Pittsburgh area, but you never know. It could be in Columbus, but I have a feeling it will be Pittsburgh, but you never know. Yeah. Columbus is a great food town. There's just so much going on here. So yeah. many brands here. So there really are. It's like the test, the, not the test, but there's a lot happening there. It's, it's it seems explosive um, with really cool things. So it is awesome. it very, it very much is. Yeah. Okay, Matt, thank you so much. You're awesome. Of course. Super nice talking with you. I appreciate it. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones. Please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just Forking Around Podcast. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at Forking Podcast. My website is just forkingaround.net. And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.